last approximately three to four years before the mayor came into office. And so we're a young organization also. And the mayor, right from the beginning, recognized that we were a sincere organization and he assisted us in many ways. In 1975, we received our first major contract. We had had very small grants at that time, and pretty much a volunteer organization. From the city of Detroit, that allowed us to open up our food co-ops. And we ran food co-ops at neighborhood service centers, and we <laughs> Thank you very much, Bernard. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, it's always a pleasure to come to Butzel. It was not too long ago, while I was mayor, that Butzel was first opened up. You know, it took a big fight to get that opened up, because some people wanted to abandon the project. I thought it was important that we have a community center here on the east side that we could be in new recreation center over there. We have new housing over there. We have a new shopping center over there. And more housing being built, both in Elmwood 3 and over on 12th Street. We have rebuilt the neighborhoods throughout this city. And when I was a boy, nobody considered Sheen and the river to be downtown. That used to be part of our neighborhood. We would go down the foot of Shane Street and fish in the Detroit River. Only when we started building it up <laughs> that it became downtown. And we built houses all along the Detroit River, all the way out to Jeff Chalmers. That's almost to the city limits, where you have rich people, middle-income people, and low-income people in these houses. That's building the city. But there are a lot of people who really didn't expect the city to be rebuilt. Remember, one of the candidates for mayor who was defeated in the primary said the last one out of the city of Detroit turn out the lights. You remember that? That councilman is still serving in the city of Detroit. As he didn't leave and he didn't turn out the lights. And the lights are still burning brightly. We've rebuilt this city in spite of economic threats. We have the highest unemployment in Detroit of any city in America. We have the largest number of people on welfare or at the poverty level. Now, when you see poverty, when you see unemployment, you see crime, you see problems. I am not attempting to excuse any criminal. We're going to arrest, convict, and move off the street any criminal we catch, and we're catching them. But nonetheless, we ought to recognize, until we get some jobs in this city, until the federal government and the state government begin to re recognize their responsibility for the cities, for the poor, for the unemployed, we're not going to see much change in the social fabric of this nation. Now, there was a time when the federal government recognized that responsibility. And I guess I keep going back to when I was a kid, when Franklin D. Roosevelt first became president. You remember WPA, yes. CCC, yes. and all the rest of those alphabets? Yes. What the president did was recognize that when the people are in need, when they cannot find jobs, it's the responsibility of the federal government provide those jobs, to give people a chance to earn a living with dignity, yeah. give them something to do with their hands, with their minds, right. as opposed to a welfare handout 
which is constantly being taken away and for which in many cases the recipients have to grovel on their knees. That is what we need today. And yet, what we see locally is a situation in which fear is being encouraged, anti-Detroit sentiments by our newspapers, by our media, our electronic media, and by electronic media, I mean radio and TV. You know, things are rough in this city, but they are rough all over. You heard a car jacking? You can't pick up a paper or turn on a radio or a television today without getting the daily report on carjacking in Detroit. But they're happening all over, in the suburbs as well as in Detroit. Carjacking is a national phenomenon. Happened in Atlanta, in Chicago, in New York, in Los Angeles. It's just another gimmicky way of committing the crime and trying to steal some money. It's not helped, by the way, by the fact that it's publicized so. There are a whole lot of copycat criminals who read about it and who hear about it. And in so doing, the idea is implanted in the head. A whole lot of people are stealing automobiles today who not, never would have dreamed of doing that until they read in the newspaper or saw it on Channel 4. <laughs> I said that because my good friend, <laughs> Bob Pizer, <laughs> who used to be my press secretary, is now with Channel 4. He knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> but, but the truth of the matter is that an atmosphere of fear, artificial atmosphere of fear of Detroit has been created by the sensationalizing of these crimes in Detroit, in the media, but it don't give the same emphasis to the same crime when it occurs outside Detroit. Now we all know about the July 4th beatings downtown. They played it every day, three times a day, four times a day for a month. I want to tell you something, all the facts are not in on that one. They have played an incomplete and incorrect version of what happened. But if you want the facts, you have to proceed with a certain amount of deliberation. It takes time. People's reputations are at stake. So you don't rush to the headlines to point the finger till you have your facts straight. You'll be hearing from us on that one, too. But the point is, there have been other beatings. That was a case out in Roseville at Mount Clemens where a young black man was beaten to death with bats. I have yet to see any television uh, announcer go up to the mayor of Roseville at Mount Clemens, stick a mic in his face, and say, do you expect people to stop coming? to Roseville or Mount Clemens because of his killing. Didn't ask that question. What about the dentist out in Birmingham that put the shotgun to the head of the 14-year-old boy? They're not asking, are you going to Birmingham? It's only, aren't you afraid of coming to Detroit? Restaurant closes. Two restaurants close. That is viewed as a result of fear of people that come into Detroit. But the truth of the matter is, we're in an economic recession. Restaurants are closing all over hell. They're closing in the suburbs. There's no mention of that. But what I'm trying to say is, we have to understand that some people 
will use any person's tragedy, any misfortune, to sell a newspaper or to popularize a radio or television program. Or even worse, just to stir up hatred. There are some people who expected the city to collapse. Last one out, turn out the lights. When I first became mayor, they asked a question in one of the major magazines, I believe it was Newsweek. Big front cover story. At that time, about four black mayors <coughs> were elected in large American cities, like Atlanta, Los Angeles, Detroit, Newark. The, news, the magazine asked a question on the cover, the new black mayors, are they the saviors or the undertakers of the city? Some of you might remember that. The article went on to strongly imply that the cities could not be saved and the only function of the black mayor would be that of the undertaker. Well, I'm no undertaker. And the city of Detroit is no corpse. It's alive and well. And it's because of people like you. It's because of people like you that's alive and well. We must grow to expect unfair attacks. We cannot allow these distortions and these attacks to cause us to lose confidence in our city. This is a great city. If it were not, it would not have survived. Why is the city great? It's great because its people are great. Strong hearts, good hearts, and faith in themselves, faith in each other, and faith in the future. That characterizes the course. I'm glad to be here today. I want to talk to you about some of the attempts that are being made. And it does not matter whether the newspaper, the media does this consciously with evil intent or innocently without bad, they couldn't have good intent. Just say innocently without bad intent. But it really doesn't matter what their intent is. That's just like giving a hand grenade to a baby. Now the baby pulls a pin on that damn grenade and it does not, don't tell me the baby didn't know what he was doing. It really does not matter. And so I say to the media, you should be very careful lest you pull the pin on that grenade and blow yourselves up along with every damn body else. I'm glad to be here because Operation Get Down has been doing some very good work in their food distribution efforts, whether it's uh, bringing hot food to people, whether it's serving people at a central location, whether it's making various commodities available. And today, I gather, is the occasion of a two-day conference that will deal in how to shop properly. We'll deal in how to get the best nutritive value out of foods. And I think that's very good. Because many of us have some bad nutrition habits. I know that I have some bad habits. I love greens swimming in grease. <laughs> the more grease, the better the grease. 
but but that's not good for you. I think you know that, right? Now, I'm, I want to tell you it's a hard thing to break. Now, my sister told me that you could take smoked turkey legs. Yeah. But I don't like turkey with my greens. <laughs> a turkey leg is still a turkey leg. <laughs> And it does not taste like salt pork. <laughs> or ham hot. Or smoked neck bones. Or something like that. It was all hungry <laughs> But what this conference is all about is how to fix tasteful foods, foods that will meet our needs of taste, at the same time be good for us nutritionally help us to live longer and more healthily. I think that is a good thing. I think it's good that Farmer Jack has co-sponsored or has subsidized this conference to the extent of paying for half of the cost and uh, providing shopping certificates, gift certificates for those who win some of the contests here, right? So this should be a very interesting two days. It's a type of community service that is long overdue. I know that it's hard for an old dog to learn new tricks. And I'm speaking about me, not you. <laughs> but we must learn new tricks uh, if we are to be able to carry on and make the contribution to ourselves, to our families, and to our communities. I want you to know that I'm very glad to have an opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, as usual, these sides ready to go, so let's go. <laughs> Let's give another hand to the mayor of the city of Detroit. And I'm quite sure that what's going to happen is that all the media is going to leave out with him because this is something positive we're doing here and they want to go in and I'm sure ask about something negative that's happening in the city. So, but that's what he was talking about and that's what always happens. So we're going to let them slide on out anyway, and we're going to go on with something positive and talk about how we can stretch the dollars. And again, we at Operation Get Down really appreciate the mayor taking the time to come out.